Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and today we're going to talk about an issue that I think most Unity developers run into at some point in their career. It's something that I struggled with, and I get questions about all the time. And I just want you to listen to the scenario, see if it matches with what you've run into, and if so, then follow along in the video, and I'm going to show you some really good techniques and tricks to simplify things. And if not, then uh, just hit the watch later button, save that off, hit the like button, and then come back to it when it actually makes sense to you when you've run into the problem. So here's the scenario. You started building a game and everything's going fine, right? You're getting your level set up, you've got one level, you've got a UI that maybe controls some things in the level or lets you select different stuff or maybe shows just data about your objects in the level, whatever it is, right? Maybe it's just showing your score or something else about your NPCs. So you build it up, everything looks good, you're ready to well, move on to level two and suddenly you go, oh, wait a minute, what do I do about my interface? Because right now my interface is all in one level. So I've got this one scene that's got a user interface, it's got all of my objects in it, and I need to make this user interface reusable. The easiest thing to do, and what I think a lot of people do to start, is just copy that UI stuff right over to the other level. With Unity now, you can open up multiple levels, you can literally just duplicate it and copy it over, or Another option that people will sometimes move to is making their user interface into a prefab. But then they suddenly find that references aren't working right, objects aren't hooking up right, and the, the entire process starts to fall apart. So they end up having to constantly modify the user interface in multiple levels or go back and rework things every time they want to make a small change. If you have one or two levels, it's probably not a big deal. Once you start building up level after level after level, it becomes a nightmare. And that's what I'm going to show you how to avoid. I'm going to show you how to set up a user interface that works across any number of levels, how to load multiple levels, kind of switch back and forth between them and have the interface bind up to whatever you have active at the time and make it so that it's easy to manage, easy to extend, and clean to use. Before we get started though, I wanted to briefly show off the different assets that I'm gonna use in this project and remind you that you can go download the code for it below. Also, don't forget to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the little notify bell. All that other stuff really helps, or even better, just share the video anywhere you like, whatever places you like to share things. Just go share it there, and it helps more than anything else you can do. Before we get into solutions, I wanna show the problem a little bit better. So here I've got my level set up, and this is called Help I'm Stuck, because this is pretty much the feeling that I had when I ran into this scenario the first time. And in it, I've got two different entities. I've got this Skeleton King and a Micro Dragon. And if you look, they both have a stats component on them, and they have an entity component on them. We'll talk a lot more about this as we go further. We're going to start with the entity, doing some health stuff, and then dive all the way into managing NPC stats, showing all that on screen. And it's going to get lots of fun, and or be lots of fun, and be pretty interesting, I think. So we've got these two things in here, and then I've got a UI system, UI system original, which has a UI controller script on it, and then it's got a reference to a stats list and a health panel that are children of it. This is how a lot of UIs that I see end up being built. So I've got a stats panel underneath it. Let's look at the health canvas though instead, or the health panel. We've got a health panel here, and then this is going to update when we take some damage. So let's play, see what that looks like, and then start worrying about what happens when we want to add a new level. So I click on my NPC and my UI all shows up. If I hit the number two on my keyboard, he takes some damage. And if I select this other guy, you can see he's back at 100% and this guy's at 60%. But again, I want this to work for level two, help I'm stuck two or help I'm stuck three. And I don't want to have to recreate this every single time. I don't want to have to drop in this UI system into every single level that I have. And if I, again, if I make changes, I don't want to have to re redo those changes. So what's the solution that you can think of that we could do for this? Again, one default and kind of obvious one is to just make this into a prefab and then reuse that prefab across multiple levels. And that works relatively well, except you have to go in and remember to set the prefab up in there. Then you also have to check for any prefab overrides. And if people are working in the scene, sometimes they'll make changes to that prefab and then break things and you end up with quite a few issues. So there's another solution. And the solution that I like to use is to put my UI into a completely separate scene. So I'm gonna go into my scenes folder now 
and just open up level one. I'm not gonna, oh, let's save it, why not? So in level one, you'll see that I've got my main camera, I've got the environment here, which is pretty much exactly the same. It's just that background from this uh, kit that I showed earlier. And then we've got the two entities in them, in here. Oh, we actually have this extra stat adder script in here. This is just for debugging. I'm going to actually remove it. But we've got an entity and a stats on each one of these. And then our main camera has this little UI loader script. I'm going to open up the UI loader script, show what it does, and then we're going to show it in action. So the UI loader script is very simple one just for me to be able to load and unload UIs at runtime in a demonstration kind of scenario and also be able to switch between different levels. The main part of the code is right here and it's very, very simple and straightforward. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna go in and press F1 and that's gonna look to see if we have a scene named UI that's loaded. If that's false, so if we don't have one, we're going to load the UI scene additively. If we do have one loaded, we're just going to unload it. All the rest of this code is just for loading and unloading different levels. We'll dive into that later. For now, it's just F1 to toggle the UI on and off. So I'm going to go in here, hit play. And once we get to that game view, look, if I click on these NPCs, nothing happens. But if I hit F1, suddenly my UI appears. Let me do that again without being in maximize mode, though. So I've got in game view, I want to turn off maximize on play. And just put the game view side by side with the scene view and just watch what happens in the scene hierarchy. So I'll hit play again. Everything loads up. There's no UI. I can go select things. I'm not going to select anything this time. Instead, I'm just going to hit F1 and load the UI. Notice that nothing showed up because I don't have anything selected. So there's nothing to show health for yet. If I go select an NPC, there we go. I've selected the dragon. You'll see that his health shows up and some of his stats show up. And if I hit two, his health goes down every time. And I can go select this other guy and his health is back at 100. But I'll hit two. He goes down to 90. Go back to that dragon who's at 50. And you can see that it's binding up and showing me the stats and the health for the different entity that I had. Even though the scene or the UI part wasn't loaded at the time. It's getting loaded later and all bound up. So let's take a peek at what that actually looks like. So I've stopped playing and it's time for us to take a look at some of the code. Let's check out the click select controller. We've already looked at that UI loader and this click select controller is sitting on the main camera as well. It also has a reference to our main camera. We'll talk about that in a moment though. Let's open up the script and see what it's got. So there are a couple things going on here. First is this reference to that camera or to the main camera. It's just a serialized field to give us a permanent reference to our camera so that we can do a ray cast into the scene. We could alternatively use something like camera.main, but I always recommend avoiding using the camera by that camera.main tag because there are some performance issues with it and just other problems that I have with tags. I don't really like to use them or recommend them. So instead, we have a serialized field of this private camera so we can assign it in the editor and use it for our raycast, which you'll see very shortly. I guess that's right down uh, yeah, on line 15. We'll talk about that when we get there though. There are a couple things going on here. Let's zoom in a little bit. After the camera, we have a public static event. If you're not used to events, don't worry, you're going to get used to them as we go through this video because they're a core part of any data finding and UI work. So we've got a static event action and it's of type entity. What this means is that we have an event that will fire off and things can listen to it. And whenever they listen to it, whenever we say, hey, this thing has happened, which is on selected entity change. So whenever we tell something that the selected entity has changed, we're going to pass in an entity as a parameter. So we're going to give them the entity that it actually changed to. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we had to give them the right entity. We could do it wrong and pass in any entity. It just means that an entity will be the parameter course, if we're doing things right and we're not trying to confuse ourselves, we'll probably pass in the selected entity. The other thing that we have here is a public static entity field named selected entity with a private setter. The reason for this is that we don't want other code changing our selected entity. We always want to fire off this selected entity changed event whenever we switch entities. And we don't, again, we don't want anything else changing that up. 
So we'll be able to set the entity, tell everything that cares about our entity changing or our selected entity changing that we've changed it. And then anything that wants to just see what entity we have selected can also read it right here from this property. Let's take a look at update now and see how that actually works, how we assign these entities, how we do that callback, and then how it's all registered and hooked up to the UI afterward. So the first thing what we're doing is in our update method, just looking to see if we've pressed the fire one button, which is just a default for left click. So I'm really just checking to see if I've left clicked on something. Then we do a screen point to ray call on our camera. What this is doing when we pass in input.mouse position, it's taking our camera and it's creating a ray from the point that we've clicked into the world. So whatever we're clicking on basically, whatever we see underneath our mouse cursor is where our ray is going to shoot. And the ray is just gonna tell us whether or not we've collided with an entity. That's really what we're looking for. Realistically, it tells us if we've collided with anything, but we're gonna ignore anything that's not an entity. So we get our ray here, which is just a type ray. I have var here, it could be ray ray or var ray. Either way, we're getting a ray. And then on the next line, line 16, we're just doing a debug.draw ray where we give it the origin, we give it the direction and a distance. If you don't give it a distance or multiply it by a number here, our ray is only gonna be one meter long coming out of the camera. It's gonna be a tiny short little line. Then we give it a color and a duration. Let's go see what that looks like real quick. So if I go back in here and hit play, if you watch in the scene view when I click around, you see that red debug ray appearing. And if I click on this entity right here, see that it's going right through them. And if I click on this guy, you can kind of see if I get a little bit closer, you can see that it's going right through this little dragon. So that's what we're using to do selection checks. So we, we draw that ray just so we can see it as a debugger. And then we do a ray cast. So we say if physics.raycast and we pass in our ray. And then we give it an output parameter of hit info, which is a ray cast hit, which is just going to have information about the thing that our ray cast hit or the first thing that our ray cast hit. So if that hits anything at all, this part will return true. If this doesn't hit anything, it's gonna return false and none of this code in here is gonna run or this code right here is gonna run. But if it does hit something, the hit info will get filled out. It'll have an object in there. And then this code in here is gonna run. The next thing that we do is we check this hit info. We look at the collider on there. So if we go back here and look at our dragon or something, it's got a capsule collider. So we get the collider from the hit info, and then we say get component of type entity. So we're gonna look to see if the thing that we had a collider on that we clicked on has an entity. And we do that right here on line 19. And we just cache that in this entity variable. Then we set selected entity to that entity and fire off this event. So a couple interesting things can happen here. One is that we could click on something that has a collider and no entity. So I clicked on a building or the ground. It doesn't have an entity. Selected entity is going to be set to null. And our on selected entity changed is going to be set to null. Or it's going to get fired off with a null. Let's give it a try real quick. So what I'm going to do now is debug by attaching. I'm using Rider, but you can do this just fine in Visual Studio as well. So I've added a breakpoint here just by clicking, turning it on, putting a little red dot there. And then I hit F5. And what we're gonna do is run through this. I'm gonna click and then the debugger is gonna break right here. It's gonna show us the entity that we've selected or the non-entity that we've selected and just kind of let us follow the flow of things. So here we go. I'll go click on somewhere in the background. And oh, I didn't hit anything. I haven't actually hit a collider. There's no colliders on any of these things. Let me click on the dragon. Now that I've clicked on the dragon, we actually have a collider here. And if I put my mouse over it, you see that it's the capsule collider on that micro dragon. Our entity was found and selected entity was set or is about to be set to this entity. So if I hit F10, it's gonna run that line of code. Selected entity got set. And now our on selected entity changed will get invoked. But if you look at it, when I put my mouse over it, it's null. There's nothing for it to call. Nothing has registered for this on selected entity change. So if I hit F11, which would normally step into the code and run whatever this is calling, it just doesn't do anything because there's no, nothing registered at all. And look down here. I also have this little um, section where if I hit escape, it sets my selected entity to null and calls the on selected entity changed with null. So that's allowing me to unselect something. Let's try that. 
I'm going to add a breakpoint there. I hit F5, which is going to let it resume playing. And then I'll go back into the editor and I'm just going to hit escape. Now you'll see that selected entity is set to a value. It's going to get set to null. And our on selected entity changed to still null. So when I hit F11, nothing really happens. It just kind of skips over it. And the reason that it skips over it, by the way, is this little operator here, this question mark dot. It's the, um, oh, I always forget the name of it now but it's the, the little Elvis operator. What it does is it checks to see if this is null, and if it is null, it doesn't run the code after the question mark. If it's not null, then it will run the code after the question mark. So another way that you could write this, let's just stop debugging real quick, is if on selected entity, oops, let's see if I can copy and paste that better. If that is not equal to null, then you could do that. So this is just an alternative way to do it. Oh, null propagation, that's the, uh, the term for it. So here I just go and hit alt enter and writer just kind of automatically cleans that up, turns it into a one liner that if I understand what that question mark means makes sense and is a little bit easier to read, takes up a little bit less space. Okay, so this is what it does without a UI. If there's no UI, there's really not much happening. We select an entity, but we don't do anything UI related. We don't bind anything up. We don't show a health bar. And if I take damage, well, take damage is gonna fire off. It might take some damage, but I'm never gonna know it because I can't see it on my entity. So how can we fix this? What can we do? Well, let's load in our UI. So I'll hit F1. Remember that's pulling in the UI from that loader script. I'm gonna go right back to it just for one second. The UI loader script, we're just looking to see if we have that UI scene loaded. If not, we're loading it. So that's what I've done here is load this UI scene. And there's an important set of scripts or an important script right here on this UI controller object. It's the same one that I had in the single version, but it's really set up so that it can run against multiple levels. So if we look at it, it just has a reference to two other panels or scripts underneath it and some code in this UI controller. Let's open it up. So let's zoom, or let's zoom out real quick, give you a real brief look at everything that's in there, and then we'll go through and talk about the different parts. So at the beginning, up top, we have reference to a stats list. That's that object that you were seeing that had all of the stats on there with the little buttons to add. And then we have another reference to a health panel. The important part, though, is in our awake. So for our awake method, we're calling click select controller dot on selected entity changed, and this is the important part, plus equals click selected controller, or click select controller on selected entity changed. So we could even, let's, let's rename this. I'm gonna change this to be handle selected entity changed because I think that giving it a shorter name might make it a little bit easier to read. And that's just control RR or F2 to do a rename in Writer or Visual Studio. So just massive or batch renamed them and I think it looks a little bit easier to read. So what we're doing here, let's even split that, is registering for this on selected entity changed event. So if I go back to it and hit, there we go, you see that, remember, it's an event, and events can be registered for by any number of things. That's why we don't do an equals this. We do plus equals. We're adding it on to the list of callbacks to fire off whenever on selected entity changed is invoked. So when this is invoked right here, what we're saying is call our handle selected entity changed method. And notice that our handle selected entity changed method has an entity as a parameter. So remember I mentioned, if we go back to it, that we're gonna be passing in an entity here because it's an action of type entity. That's why we need to have the entity as a parameter on the method that we're calling because it's gonna get passed in. By the way, it is worth noting, you can put commas here and have multiple parameters. You don't have to have a single parameter. We're just using one right here because it makes sense. So we could have multiple entities, integers, strings, whatever type of object you wanna pass around. You just have to make sure that you handle it when you're calling it with the invoke and passing it in and that you're handling it on the other side. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to compile. Okay, so let's take another peek at this. We register for on selected entity changed here. That plus equals means we register for. Don't worry about the minus, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then when we call this invoke, our handle selected entity changed method is gonna get called. It's gonna pass in the entity and we're gonna skip past the stats part first because it's a little bit more complicated. Just talk about what happens with the health panel first. So if the health panel is not null, which we know it's not null because we've assigned it here, but maybe somebody is working on the scene and they've added a new object or they wanna disable the health panel, they deleted it, 
whatever, we don't want the health panel to show up, it could be null. So we want to make sure that we check for it. If the health panel is not null though, then we call this method named bind and pass in the entity. Let's talk really briefly about binding though and what that means. So what we're doing here is setting up some simple data binding. And if you look at the definition of data binding on Wikipedia, it says that it's a general technique that binds data sources from a provider and consumer and synchronizes them. I don't know that that really simplifies it, but the idea is that we give an object like our UI element a thing that it needs to hook up to. And then it does all of the work in that binding to manage updating itself when something has changed. Now this could be done a bunch of different ways. We're gonna use events and we're gonna dive right back into that. But I wanted to just point out that data binding is a very common thing. It's something that you'll see across all different types of programming and pretty much all different projects. Everybody does it in slightly different ways, although in some systems there are very well-defined practices for how you do data binding. In Unity, not so much, but ours is gonna be relatively simple. And I found that most of the time when you wanna bind things in Unity to your UI, there's not much more that you have to do beyond what we're gonna be doing right now. So let's jump back into it. So we've got our bind method. Let's open up that code again. And let's go take a look inside this bind method of the health panel and see what it does. And also just check out the health panel. So our health panel has a couple things on it. It's got a health bar, a health text, and a panel root serialized field. Then it has a private entity that is the bound entity. Let's zoom that in a bit. And we're gonna skip past the on destroy for just a moment. We'll go back to deregistering and what this minus equals means shortly after we go through the actual registration process. Let's look at the bind method here. So our bind method does a couple things. First, we check to see if we're already bound to something. And if we are, we do this deregistering. Again, we'll talk about that in a moment. But next thing we do is set our bound entity to the entity. So imagine the first time we call this, our bound entity is empty or null. And we're saying, hey, bound entity, you are now the entity that got passed in. So when our UI controller has the handle selected entity changed called, so we've clicked on something, it invoked, it came all the way through here and we say, hey, health panel bind to that selected entity. Then we say if the bound entity is not null, because remember we could say bind to null or no entity. So if it's not null, we turn the panel root on, we register for another event on this bound entity, this on health changed event, and then we call handle health change. So we're doing two different things here and we did this in the UI controller. Let's go back to that for a moment. So in the UI controller in awake, not only do we register for handle selected entity changed, we actually call it right after we register for it. The reason for this, and the reason that we're doing it in the health panel as well, is that when we first call this awake, our UI or our level that are with our click select controller could already have a selected entity. So the entity has been selected, they already clicked on it, they did whatever they needed to do, which in our case is really just clicking on it. And then they loaded the UI. And what we want to happen is for our UI to still update and bind. So when it awakes, we just say, hey, assume that, uh, or pretend that somebody just clicked on whatever the selected entity is and handle it just like you would in that case. So we wanna be able to make sure that we're setting up ourselves by default when we, when we initialize. And I do that either right before or right after registering for the event. Let's go back into that bind of the health panel though. In the health panels bind, we're doing exactly that. We're saying, hey, on health changed, call this handle health changed event. So whenever our bound entity, that's only the one that we've selected, so it'd be like the dragon or the skeleton guy right now, whenever that thing's health changes, call handle health changed. Also, call it right after, and we'll pass in the health amount. Because handle health changed, look at that, it takes an integer for the health amount. And if we look at this event on health, on health change, so I'm gonna hit F12 and go to it, you see that it actually has a parameter type of int. And that's the amount of health that we're having or that we have after we take damage. In fact, if you look at it right here on line 13 of our take damage method, which is how we're taking damage, we're actually just calling on health change dot invoke and passing in our health amount. So let's go back and take a look at handle health change. Handle health change doesn't do much. It does the normal UI stuff. So this is where we get into doing what a UI would normally do without all of the binding. Right, so we, we could have like on our bound entity, 
go find the health panel or have a reference to the health panel somewhere and go say, hey, um, change over to, you know, set your health to this. But then we also have to manage uh, which one of these things is supposed to do that. Right? If we had that on every entity, like, hey, whenever our health changes, go find the health UI and then set it, then we'd also have to do some determination of are we the right thing? Are we the thing that's supposed to be updating that UI element? And that's kind of what we're getting here. With the bound entity setup, we are binding to a very specific one so that whenever its health changes, we can update the UI. And our entity doesn't even need to know that there's a UI around. Our entity is fine. If we add in a UI later on in the game, we don't have any UI. Or we strip it out or we add in three different ways to show health in different spots or whatever it is. Our bound entity or our entity itself doesn't have to change. So back into our handle health changed. I got a little excited there. We set the text for the amount of health and then we set the fill amount on our fill bar. Let's go check that out. Let's see what it looks like. I want to run through the process and then I want to actually step through it so you can see the full flow of how this is all working. So I go select the entity there and let's do it with the no UI on. I select the dragon and then I turn a UI on again. Our speed shows up, our damage shows up. We're kind of ignoring that, but our health shows up as 100, 90, 80. Let's get them down to 70. Hit escape, reselect them, hit escape. Let's unload the UI, reload the UI, select them. Now I'm gonna unload the UI and we're gonna add in a breakpoint. So we're gonna go to our UI controller. We go right up to the top. I'm gonna put a breakpoint in here and hit F5. Give it just a moment to attach. And then I'm gonna turn on the UI and we're gonna step through and see what happens. Now I'm gonna make sure I have an entity selected first. So I'll just click on this guy. Yep, hit my breakpoint to select the king, the skeleton king. Then I'll go back in and I'm gonna enable my UI. Hit F1 and here we go. So the first thing I wanna note is that our on selected entity changed event is null. Nothing is registered for it yet, but if I hit F10, we should see that it now has a system.action of type entity. And if I expand it out, I can even see the method is that handle selected entity changed. So that's now registered as a callback. Whenever we call on selected entity changed, our handle selected entity changed method should get called. But we're also calling it again right after the registration in our awake. And our selected entity is that skeleton king. So if I step in, hit F11, I can step over these stats list parts for now. Again, it's a little bit more complicated. So just hit F10. We'll go into the health panel one though. So I'm gonna hit F10 on this check, then F11 to go into the binding. First thing I note is that my bound entity for my health panel is null. So I don't have anything bound to it yet, which makes sense, I just loaded this up. And then we'll see that we're setting our binding on line 24. So I hit F10 and now our bound entity is valid. Now we check that it's not null. We know it's not null because we just kind of passed it in, but I'm gonna step into it. We'll turn on the panel root, which let's go take a peek at that in just a moment. But it's really turning on the panel that our health interface is on. And then we set up a callback for on health changed to call our handle health changed method, which is right down here. Let's go put a breakpoint there. I'm gonna put a breakpoint right here on line 39 so we can play with that a little bit. Then we'll hit F10 and I'm gonna hit F10 and watch, it's gonna stop at my breakpoint because it went into handle health changed and we're gonna set the health to our current amount which is just that health is 100 so it's gonna set everything to 100 and we're good. By the way, our fill percent right now is kind of set to cap or, or be exactly around 100 health. Uh, we'd have to convert it to a percent if we wanna do a different amount but I just stuck with 100 because I thought it was pretty easy to use. Okay, so there we go. We called that handle health change. We step out, step out, and step out, and we're kind of at the end of it. That's the end of our awake life cycle. And if we go look in here, we've got our health showing up. Now, remember, if I hit two, our entity is gonna take some damage. So let's see what it looks like when he takes damage. Let's go into our entity. I'm gonna add a breakpoint in the take damage method. And then I'm gonna go in here and hit two. So I didn't select anything. Notice I just kind of clicked off in the air. But I hit two and our health is going to change by an amount, which is just 10. And that's just because if I go up to call stack here, this is the call stack window in Rider, by the way, see that our key code two, if I hit alpha two, it just calls selected entity that take damage and passes in an amount of 10, assuming that we have a selected entity. Okay, so we reduce our health by 10, goes down to 90, nothing's happened yet. Our on health changed event, however, has something registered for it. So if I hit F11, you'll see that it's calling into our handle health changed. And if you look here, that, this is why, because we told it whenever health changes, call our handle health changed. 
And here we have passed in the 90, so now it's gonna know, hey, go set the health to 90. Okay, that's pretty interesting and pretty simple, but what happens if we switch NPCs? So I go select this dragon. How is it all changing? So I clicked on him. Let's take a peek. So here we do that raycast, the same thing we did before for our client, or click select controller, if I can remember the name of that. We've found an entity, and that entity is the micro dragon guy. So we set our selected entity, and then on selected entity changed, it's not null anymore, so if I hit F11, I can step into it and see what it's doing. Oh, it's calling our handle selected entity changed because we registered for it in awake. And then we step over, step past the stats thing again for a moment, go into the health panel thing. It's the same exact health panel, but now we're telling it to bind to this new entity. So let's step into that and see what it looks like. So I hit F11 and then I hit F10 and now our bound entity is not null. So we're binding to an entity, but it's gonna be a different entity. So I'm gonna hit F10 again and talk a little bit about what's going on here, why this exists and what this is for. If I register for an event when I no longer want that thing to fire off or that thing to be true so that I don't want the event to call this code anymore, I have to deregister it. And we do that with the minus equals to remove an event registration. If I didn't do this, then whenever the health of the skeleton king changed, we would still be calling handle health changed. So right now it's not, it's kind of hard to reproduce because if I hit two, it just kill, hurts my selected thing. But imagine these things are just taking damage all over the place from AEs and fighting each other and stuff. When I've changed the selection, I don't want to keep calling handle health changed on because the old thing that I had selected has its health changed, right? I only want it to work for the currently bound entity, not the previously bound ones. So the minus equals is very important to prevent that from getting called again. It's also very possible to accidentally register the event multiple times and not deregister it ever. Like if, if we bound it every time in on enable or, um, you can kind of see here we do in on on destroy. If we just kept turning the thing on and off, it'd be very easy to leave these event registrations around. So let's talk about that for a moment too. So on destroy of our health panel, why is it doing this? Why is it deregistering? So imagine our UI elements go away, like we were in there and we've unloaded our UI, but we still have this bound entity set up on our health panel. Uh, what's gonna happen well, our bound entity is gonna go away because it's no longer bound, but the on health changed event registration that we have, that is not going away. So our entity, like the skeleton or the dragon that's sitting there, it's still gonna try to call this handle health changed method, except it's gonna be doing it on a health panel that doesn't exist, it's been destroyed. So when we destroy the object that the thing or the callback is going to, which is our handle health changed on this health panel, we need to deregister anything that's calling into it. In this case, it's just removing that on health changed part. So we deregister it there and we also deregister it whenever we change the entity. Basically, whenever an entity becomes unbound, we want to deregister it. And you see that we do that also up a level in our UI controller. Okay, so let's step through some more. We're, set, we're removing the health changed event registration. So if I hit F10 again, you see that's gone back to null now on our bound entity. And our new entity is gonna become our bound entity, which still doesn't have a health change registration. Then we'll say, hey, bound entity is not null. So set the panel to active, register for health change. Oh, look, it's registered again. And then handle health changed. And remember if I hit F10, I hit this next breakpoint, And we go in and we see the health is 100 for this guy and the fill amount's gonna be at 100%. Now I want you to remember, if you're not super comfortable with events or you just feel a little bit confused, don't worry, don't get too overwhelmed. Events are a very important part of C-sharp programming in general and just, I'd say in general game development or any programming really. And they're something that you need to master, but they take a little bit of time to kind of get used to and get, I guess, really familiar with, especially the whole concept of having to unregister them. So if you're not sure, just remember that whenever you register for an event, you almost always want to unregister for it somewhere. And you want to avoid situations where you register for an event multiple times um, for the same thing. Like I wouldn't want to accidentally call this twice. Let's, let's say I did, let's say I copied this and I pasted it and I called it twice. What's actually gonna happen here is whenever the health changes, it's gonna call handle health changed 
two times. In this case, it probably wouldn't matter. You might, might not even be able to notice. But if we were doing something other than just updating a UI element, we would almost definitely notice. If we're writing something out into a log, we'd have multiple log entries. If we we're saving some data off, we'd be taking twice as long to save the data or send the data or whatever it is. So we don't want to double register for events and we want to make sure that we definitely clean up our event registrations with the minus equals. Let's go take a quick peek at that uh, UI controller as well. Because here on the in the on destroy, whoops, what have I done? Let's go back. You see that I do the same thing where we unregister for the event in on destroy. And this is a pretty common practice to just in on destroy, unregister for anything that I've registered for in start or awake, just to make sure that it's cleaned up and it's all gone. So let's talk about some more advanced scenarios now. Like let's say we want to load up another level. Is this going to work? How is this all going to work? Is everything going to break? Well, let's try it out. So I told you before in our UI loader script, let's open it up. We have an option here to load up a different level. So F3 will find scene two or level two and unload it and load level one. Let's look at F4 because that's the one that loads level two. So and if I hit F4, we find level one and we just say, hey, unload it if it exists. And then we say, hey, if we don't have level two loaded, add it. So load it additively. So this is that scene manager load level async. Load it additively. And then when it completes, this is kind of an important weird little callback here. We're actually registering for an event. So if you look at the tooltip, you can probably see the little tiny word event there. But what we're doing is we're registering for the completed event on load scene async. So whenever this is finished, it's going to fire off the completed event and it's going to run our code afterward. Now, there is another way to do this. Right now we're using a lambda expression. If I cut this, I could say handle level two load completed. And I could hit alt enter and create a method for it. And see, it's going to give me this asynchronous operation or async operation. I could paste in my code right here. Let's just delete that all down, get it nice and small. And we could do it just like this. So here, let's move. I'm going to put this on to the next line. Just move, know that this is just so that it fits all on the screen. So I move the dot completed down. It'll work fine either way. But um, what's happening here is that we're just calling this, this method. Now, the alternative way or the way that it was written is just doing an event callback and shoving it all into a little delegate that makes it so I don't have to make another method here. And you can see that right here on uh, this line 23 and 24. We just say, hey, give me the operation, which is that parameter from the event. So remember, if I look at mouse over it, it says it's an action of async operation. Operation is that parameter is that same parameter that's getting put into here. But here we can do it in a lambda statement and we don't even use it. So you notice there's no references to it. We just call scene manager dot set active scene. The reason that I'm doing this by the way is just to set whatever scene that we've loaded to be the active scene so that the lighting works. All right, so I've reattached and let's just load the levels back and forth. So I'm gonna load into level one, load into level two and I'll click again and let's just watch what happened again. So the reason this is still working and the reason that our UI still hooks up and just kind of gives us access to the selected entities is again that our click selected controller on selected entity changed event is static. If I go back to it, remember it's a static event. So it's getting called by any click select controller. It doesn't matter what click select controller is um, loaded. If it's the one in level one or the one in level two, they're both calling into this same static event. They're not calling into an event on themselves. And they're calling that event to just say, hey, something has changed or our selected entity has changed. And then our registration, of course, just stays working with our UI controller. So as long as we've loaded in a UI controller and we haven't destroyed it, which unregisters it here, then we're registered for the event callback and we're gonna get the health panel binding and everything's just gonna work. So that's how it essentially works. But now I wanna talk about that stats panel because I think that when we start off doing something simple like a health panel might be relatively easy. Oh, look at that, hit a breakpoint. Let's get out of that, F5, F5, get rid of the breakpoints. But doing something like a health panel isn't too hard. What if we wanted to do something that's a little bit more complex like some stats? Like I wanted to be able to select this guy. Oh, let's hit F5, 
They stop with all the debugging, and I want to go give him some speed or whatever. Now, normally, I probably wouldn't just have buttons where you select a character and then add a stat to him, but you might, like, go pick up a power-up, or you've, you know, done something to the NPC to change his stats in some way, and you might want to be able to show that in your UI and also just reference it around in your game. Because remember, these concepts for eventing don't just apply to UI stuff. They can apply all across your game architecture, but... I think UIs are just a really easy way to show how to take advantage of it and how much time it can save. So here we go. I can set all of these stats and just keep modifying them and click off, click back on, and see all of the stats appear. Let's see what that looks like. Why does that stat system work? How does it work? How are we showing the different amounts of stats? And even if I go in and like select one of these dragons, I, yep, do I have a, yeah, I got my special stat adder script. I can even add in a new stat that they don't have, like max health, and then hit, what is it, space I've set it up to? Space, bam, now he's got a new max health stat. And it's added to his stats and then also shows up in the UI. Let's take a peek now. So you may wonder like what this UI scene looks like. In fact, let's just take a peek at it. We have a couple things in here. We have that UI controller I've talked a lot about and we have the health panel. And if I go look at this health canvas, it's actually a separate canvas here with a panel underneath it. And then underneath that, we have a fill for our, or it's just a fill image for that bar right there. And then a text mesh pro text for the text in here. Uh, the reason that they're in separate canvases, by the way, I, there's a whole talk about the benefits of splitting up canvases and the, some of the performance characteristics. But generally, you want your canvases to be grouped together so that they change together. So that if something is changing on a canvas, uh, when things change, if they all change together, put them on one canvas. If they change independently or at different times, they should usually be on separate canvases, primarily for performance, but also find that it makes it easier to manage these things a little bit. So let's look at the other part though, this stats canvas, because this is where I think the more interesting stuff is happening and where there's a nice easy pattern that you can use to kind of follow along. So I'm gonna switch to my scene to 2D mode, I'll zoom out, that's just my scene view. And let's take a peek here. So we've got the stats canvas selected and expand it out underneath it because on the root notice there's really nothing. It's just a standard canvas. Underneath it, I have a empty rect transform that has a stats list script on it. Underneath that, we have a stats grid. And if I scroll this down, you see that it's just using a grid layout group where I can and it just defined the size and the width of the columns and the height of them. So I've set it to 300 and I set them to, they're, they're 50, they're, they're 40, oh, 450 I mean, or 40. You can see this is just a, a standard grid layout group for setting up the size. I like to use these instead of horizontal and vertical layout groups. A lot of the time, just find them a little bit easier to work with. Okay, underneath there, we have a couple different things. Well, we have a stat holder, and then we have a bunch of stat holder clones. Let's stop playing and see what this looks like outside of play mode. So stop play mode, and I'll jump to my scenes, and open up that UI. In fact, I'm gonna add it, just drop it in additively, so we still have a nice pretty background. Now let's expand out the stats list one more time, and under the stats grid, we have a stats holder. And that is this object here with the red background, the text, another text, and a button and a line. So if I disable it, you can see that's this object here. This is kind of the template or prefab for all of the stats that I'm using, except it's not in a separate prefab or anything. It's actually just a child of this so that I can see it in here and see what it looks like. And the code is just going to find it and disable it automatically so that I don't have to worry about it. And I don't have to drop one out every time I wanna see what it looks like and play around with it. So my stat holder underneath it, or well, actually let's look at the script. It has a single script called stat holder, which has a label and a value. And then that just links up to the label here, which is the name where it says strength and a value, which is that 140. We also have a button on here. Let's take a look at the button. The button has an on click event calling to the stat holder, which is just its parent and it's calling add stat on it. So let's go look at that stat holder script. The stat holder script has, well, not much to it really. We have those two fields, the label and the value. They're both text mesh pro text objects. Then we have a stat data 
and a stats private object that we're binding to. So you see that using a similar pattern, except we're not binding to an entity, instead we're binding to the stats that an entity has and a piece of stat data. And then we have this add stat method that it says it's never used, but remember if we go back in here and look at the button, our button is set up bound to call add stat. So when we click on the button, it calls add stat on this parent. What does that do? Well, it says, hey, give us our stat type, figure out what that is, and we call stats.modify, and we pass in the stat type and the amount. So we're just increasing it by one. Let's go take a look at what stats.modify does real quick. And here it is. So what we're actually doing in this modify is grabbing a stat from our runtime stat values, which is actually just a list of stats. We're getting it by the stat type, so that's the strength, speed, damage, whatever it was. In fact, if we hit, uh, let's see, F12, and just go look at stat type, you see, here we go. Get an old version of a controller in there. But you see that we have, it. it's just an enumeration of different types with strength, speed, damage, and max health in there. Let's go back. So we're finding the first runtime stat that has the matching stat type. There should only ever be one that matches. We could also use a dictionary or something keyed to make this look up a little bit faster, but it's small enough list that it just didn't make sense to overcomplicate it. So we're using the first or default to find the one that matches the right stat type. If it's equal to null, so if it's a new stat that we don't have on our character yet, then we go add in a new stat data. So we instantiate a new stat data, set the stat type, and then we add that to our list. Then we take whatever value we had and increment it by the amount. Remember right now we're just passing in a one, so we just click and add one. So if it's a new stat, it's actually gonna get created, added to the list, and then the value is gonna get set from zero to one. If it's an existing one, this won't be null and we'll just be incrementing the value by one. Let's look at how runtime stat values exists though what that means, and then talk about the on stat change event invocation because that's when things get a little bit more complicated. But if you don't know what this runtime stat stuff is, it might not make any sense. So let's scroll up to the top of the stats class. A couple of important things. We have that on stat changed, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. We also have this private serialized stat datas field. This is so that we can give our character some default stats when we're setting them up. So that's why when I go in here and I select one of these guys, I see some default stat values. And if I go pick one of them, let's go select them, select the micro dragon. I've got the stat data's expanded out. So here it just collapsed and expanded. And underneath it, it just has some elements for different stats that I've given him as a default. Now in a real project, I'd make a custom editor for this so that I don't have to do this weird element editing stuff, but it seemed kind of outside of this video. So right now we're just expanding it out and I can just add in more stats. I could add in a third stat just by changing that to a three, go pick, hey, he also has you know, 22 max health. And if I hit play, load my UI, I should be able to select him and watch it. Let's see, I select him, there we go, I've got my max health at 22. The other thing that's important to note though is this runtime stat values. So I told you where the stat data has come from, that's our defaults. The runtime ones are our actual like live stat values. So right now my damage is at 21, if you look here, if I hit plus, the runtime value is going up. The de definition data here, this 21 here, is not changing. And that's mostly just so that I don't accidentally misuse things and change my stat data on a prefab or some other placed object instead of the runtime version of it. I wanna make sure that I'm not accidentally modifying serialized fields. So I create a new set of that data that's the runtime modified ones. And I expect to be modifying stats constantly. Um, depending on the type of game, we could have all kinds of different things modifying the stats and having that base value there can be really helpful. Sometimes I might just wanna recalculate and just know what that base value is and like all of the items or something else and then add that all up and put it into runtime stats whenever they change. There are a lot of different ways to go about doing it, but having them in a separate list of stat datas helps a lot to simplify things. Okay, so we've got that figured out. We now have our runtime list of stats and we have this on stat changed that's getting modified or getting invoked. So let's see, how do we find out how this works? A quick and easy way to do this is in Rider or Visual Studio, go select the event and just hit shift F12. And this is gonna actually show us all of the places that the event is re referenced. So this could be where it's registered for, deregistered for, invoked or anything else. So if I look here, 
You'll see that it has my usages of onStat changed. And in modify, if I just double click on it, this is the invocation. So the read access is actually technically the invocation. The write access is where we're going to be doing the binding and unbinding. So if I look in my stats list, remember I have the bind method and I have the on destroy. Both of these, the on destroy and this first binding one here have the minus because they're deregistering for the event. The one we're actually registering is this one right here. I just double click on it and I can go to it. And here you'll see that it's in this stats list script. So it's a kind of big script. I'm gonna zoom it out a bit and we'll talk briefly about how it works. So the stats list, I guess let's go up to the top, has that stats holder prefab, which if we look at it, stop playing real quick and go take a peek. So we look at our stats list. If we select the stats holder prefab, remember it's just the child in that grid. It's not actually a prefab like in a normal prefab way. In fact, I should probably rename it and call it like template or something other than the word prefab. But we've got this object here that we're going to instantiate multiple of, and then we have the root for where those go. And if I select it again, stats list, go click on the root, the root is just the grid. Okay. So in our awake, we set the object or the stat holder prefab, the one that we're cloning or making copies of, to not active. That's where I said we're just gonna hide the existing one. Since we're in a grid, the layout's gonna automatically adjust for that and we'll just have a hidden object there that shows up again when we're not editing or when we're not playing, when we're in edit mode. And on destroy, we look for any bound stats that we might have because we're not binding to an entity, we're binding to stats and we deregister for that event the on stats changed if we happen to have one around. So next we have the bind method. And remember this is the one that we glossed over or I skipped over multiple times in UI controller. So in UI controller, when the selected entity changed, we would bind the health panel to the entity. We'd also bind the stats list to the entity's stats. So let's go back into our stats list. When we do that binding, what we're doing is saying, hey, if the bound stats is the same as the existing one, then um, set bound, oh, if it's null, hide the object. So for rebinding to nothing, just hide our root object so that we don't have that background, but then just bail out. So this is just saying, hey, if they're the same, return, but also if they're the same and they're null, just make sure that your root object isn't active so that we don't have that empty stats panel. Then we say, hey, if bound stats is not equal to null, so we've kind of gotten past this, if it's not null, then register for or deregister for the on state changed event or stat changed. I said state stat. So on stat changed event and then set our new bound stats. This should look a lot like the entity binding, right? And then we go through and despawn all of the holders. So we get the bound stats. We set it up so that it's bound to this stats. Then we loop through all of our existing object or stat holders and destroy all of the game objects. Now, I want to be really clear here, in a bigger scenario, or in a scenario where you care about memory management, which is like in a real game, you probably don't want to just destroy these and recreate them. It's much better to hold them around, pool them, and reuse them. But again, I didn't want to overcomplicate this too much and dive into pooling and events and UIs and everything else. So just remember that if you're doing this in a bigger project, um, once you get a little bit further along, remove the destroying part and switch to pooling these instead. So keep them around, deactivate them and reuse them as much as possible instead of recreating them. Now, let's just say that uh, you're doing that though and we're gonna pretend that you're gonna do that later. Anyway, what we'll do after that is clear out the holders list. So this is just a list of all of the stat holders that we've created and we just destroyed them. So we need to clear that list. Then we say if the bound stats is not equal to null, Tell, register for that stat changed event and call our bound stats on, ooh, the name for that is, is very bad. Let's call this handle stat changed. Always good to rename things when they don't make sense either or when you just can't read them out loud. So we bind for our stats on stat changed to call handle stat changed, which we'll look at in just a moment. Then since it's not null, we set our game object to, to active so that it shows up. And then we loop through all of our runtime stat values and create a stat holder. Let's look at create stat holder real quick. Create stat holder just instantiates based off of that prefab, which again I mentioned is really like a template, not a prefab, and puts it into the holder as its position. So that's just the parent transform that we're giving it. 
Then we call stat holder dot bind and we bind it to the bound stats and the stat data. We set it to active so that the stat holder shows up. And then we add it to our list of holders, mostly, oh, primarily so that we can clear it out and destroy it later. But also because when a stat changes, we want to be able to update it. So the last thing that we did here, it was kind of glossed over is when we register for a bound stats on stat changed, let's go take a look at that. That's this method in our stats. So whenever we modified a stat, remember we were calling on stat change. So we hit the plus, our on stat change is getting called on our stats, which is that object on the character, or on the entity. It's not the individual stat, it's like our, all of our stats. So when that gets invoked, we call handle stat changed. And here we just look at our holders list. Oh, and holders actually is a dictionary. I think I said it was a list, it's a dictionary. And that's mostly so that we can look it up and use it keyed. Um, so we try to find the holder that has our stat type on it. So let's go look at holders real quick. Holders is a dictionary of stat type and stat holder. So this is a quick lookup by stat type. So we can give it a stat type like health or max health and say, hey, give me the holder for max health if you have one. Or we say, hey, give me the holder for speed. It'll only allow one of each type to be added in there. And each one of those will have a single stat holder. Although the stat holder could technically be null, we're not ever gonna have that situation in our case. So we're creating stat holders in our create stat holder and adding them. And when we add them, by the way, I should have meant, noticed this right when I saw the code, but we add it with stat type as the key and stat holder as the value. So when a stat changes, we try to find the stat holder value here by using the holders.trygetValue. value. And on a dictionary, what this will do is it'll look for an entry that has the first parameter as a key. So it's gonna look for an entry that has our stat type as the key. And then it's going to, if it's true, so if it's able to find it, that's what the try get value does. It's gonna return true if it's able to get it, false if it's not. If it is able to get it, it's gonna put the value or the stat data into this existing stat value parameter. It's an output parameter. And then we'll call existing stat data dot bind and we'll bind it up to the stats in that stat data entry. Otherwise we go through and create the new one. So if it didn't exist, we create a new one, which is then gonna add it and then of course do the binding. So we either bind here or there, one of the two spots, depending on how the stat has changed. And actually after looking at this again, I think that the name bind here is a little bit misleading because we're not actually binding the objects in this case. We're really just setting the data here. So I'm gonna rename this bind method with control shift RR or just control RR and I'll call this set data because I think it can be a little bit confusing to misuse the word there. We're not actually binding it, we're just setting the data, which is also why we're doing that in handle stat changed. If we were doing a binding every time a stat changed, something might be a little bit off. I don't think that that would make sense. But setting the data is exactly what we want. So we're doing our actual binding when we do the event registration here. This is our bind method. The other one was kind of, I think, misnamed or just mislabeled. So I wanted to clarify that and clean it up a little bit. The last thing I wanted to take a quick peek at too was the stat data class because I realized I may have kind of glossed over it. The stat data class is just a public class that's marked serializable so that it shows up as uh, expandable children inside the inspector. And it has a public stat type on it and a value. It's just a data structure that I can use to hold the existing runtime stats and the I guess design time stats for our NPCs or our entities there. So this system, again, it works relatively well and it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And I tried to keep it very unopinionated. It's very easy to build up an entire framework around something like this, where you have your own um, base classes and interfaces that you're reusing along the way. But I wanted to show the core part of how this thing works, how to set up the separation and have your UI be a totally separate scene or even have multiple UIs, be able to swap out different UIs at different times or on different devices and have everything just kind of work. And that's really the goal of this. If this is the kind of thing you're interested in though, um, please let me know. If you made it all the way to the end, definitely hit the like, share and alert buttons and all that stuff. And just leave a comment and let me know. I'd love to do more of these longer, more in-depth videos where I focus on problems that I think a lot of us struggle with and um, again, yeah, if you like this kind of thing, make sure that you just let me know so I'll keep doing more of them. Also, uh, as always, a special thanks out to everybody on Patreon.
really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. And um, I think I'm out of things to say. Let's go back in and play one more time. One of these times I need to make one of these into just like a real interesting, fun game too, as a demo. Sometime soon. All right, anyway, thanks again. Bye.